colleagues. Welcome one, welcome all. Everyone is muted, but the band, myself, and Steve Berlin. I think there's an option on your computer to see everyone. Oh yeah, there everyone is, okay. Howdy everyone, can you hear me? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Okay, good. Um, we've got Joey, Miles, and Tony, also known as the Great Fastball. And we've got Steve uh, live from, I believe you're all at your respective houses in Austin, right guys? Yep. Yes. And we've got Steve Berlin, who produced the Help Machine, uh, live from, it looks like a disco club, I know, but he's actually in Memphis, uh, the studio in Memphis, the hardest working man in rock and roll. And uh, I'm just going to give it a minute for everyone to file in, and then we'll get, we'll get chatting here. Um, it's 11.05 Central Time. This thing cuts hard at 12.15 Central Time. So I just want to let everyone know that we got to have this wrapped up by 1215 and we do want to take some questions. If you have a question, please type it at the bottom. You'll see um, chat. Click on chat and type the question and uh, subject to how many we get and how things are kind of rolling over the next 60 minutes, I'll punch you in and you can ask a question to, um, to the band or Steve. So, um, I think we're all in and everyone's purposely muted other than the band and Steve. So I guess let's get going here. Um, the first question that was on my mind that I'll ask is, um, and I think it was you, Miles, <clears throat> was the name Steve Berlin, did it come out of my mouth or your mouth? I, I think it came out of your mouth. And I don't know if you remember this, Steve, but you and I had met, I think like the summer before, in Hudson, New York, I was with Joseph Arthur and we, you, you were with Los Lobos right. and we met and had lunch in the catering area with Joe. Right. And, uh, and I, and so bottom line was I had your info and I had just, you know, a year ago hung out with you. So I think Miles brought it up and then I reached out to you, but is that how you remember it, Miles? I, I got what I'm, the question I'm posing is how did Steve Berlin produce the record? Uh, I think I, he was on a list of, people that Tony and I and Joey were talking about. I don't know. I don't really That's remember. That's what I remember. A list. But I don't know who else was on the list. Who else was on the list? I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> I remember the first choice wasn't available. <laughs> no, no offense. I don't know what the first, I don't remember. I just thought all of a sudden it sprang into my mind because I'd seen that Steve produced Sweet Spirit. Is that right? Or was it her other band? No, Sweet Spirit. Yeah. So I remember seeing that about a year before and going, wow, he's, he's, and I was like, he seems to be working with a lot of Austin bands. Maybe he'd work with us. And so. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. I think that's how that right. happened. Yeah. So I make the phone call to Steve Berlin. Steve Berlin's interested. And there's 11 songs on the help machine. By the way, to everyone, we're, we're doing this as a, as a celebration of sorts of the help machine. Um, it came out on October 18th, 2019. Um, I'm assuming you all have it. If you haven't, I'll send you a link where you can all listen to it. And, um, you know, the bands were gearing up to go out on a tour. It feels like we still kind of, in my mind, we still just put the damn thing out, but here we are a year later, but we, we put the record out. The new year comes, which is now 2020. And the band were gearing up to go on a fairly lengthy 34 day tour when COVID happened. And then everything, as we all know now, came crashing down. And then through the summer, we did a few things. We launched an, another uh, video that Tony was instrumental in getting uh, out to the world for White Collar. But we hadn't really kind of circled back and promoted the record, in my mind anyway, as much as, as I wanted to and we wanted to. So, um, that's kind of why we wanted to jump on and, you know, give a tip of the cap to the help machine. And so it's 11 songs that came out a year ago, Miles, Tony, Joey, where did the songs, did you have the songs written? Did you send them to Steve in advance? Did you all just get in a room? Um, discuss. Uh, my songs were both start at the same time. Yeah. Let's talk over each other. You want to go first? Uh, I was just going to say how we did a lot of uh, 
you know, demoing on our own. And we had a pretty sizable list of tunes together. And, uh, you know, we took some time to gather all that material. Uh, and then basically we handed it to Steve to pick what he liked of what we submitted. And so Steve's sort of responsible for the uh, what's on that record and, and how it, uh, you know, how it came to be what it is. Right. That's, tr that's true. He picked the, the tunes. I had a bunch of songs that I'd already written, actually. I had some from uh, 2013. I was looking back to when I was trying to, going through my emails, trying to, I type in the name of the song just to see first evidence of when I was sending it to people or, or whatever. And it turns out a couple of them were like 2013. Wow. So that's. You had actually recorded like formal sessions. Yeah. A couple of them. That's right. So there are two of the songs, Friend or Foe and Help Machine, I did in Marfa. And in the case of the Help Machine, almost all of it was just, most of it was there. And like, we could have redone it, but Steve said, why, why do you want to do that? <laughs> it was largely that too, wasn't it? What's that? Friend and Foe was a lot of that stuff too. We didn't. Well, that one we, that one we inserted a, a bridge into that wasn't there. Uh, but Friend or Foe also had a lot of stuff. And, you know, when I was doing it, I wasn't, I don't know, I guess I was trying to make another solo record. I'm not sure, but the stuff just sat there. So I recorded it in 2000, uh, like 13 or something like that, or 14. And then we did Step in the Light. So those songs didn't even, they weren't even mentioned. Like they didn't even come up somehow. Or maybe I, they came up and it was crickets when I, <laughs> when I submitted them for Step in the Light. I, for whatever reason, they, they didn't, they were, they just weren't in consideration. I think for Step in the Light, we were really trying to just like, it was like a reset and we were like, let's get back to, let's get back to playing together and let's, let's make a real like rock and roll album, like the first album. I think that was kind of our ethos on that one. And that's why those songs weren't. Right. Stepping into light was sort of like getting together with Frenchie and rock yeah. and roll locally, locally, you know, recorded with. Right. You know. Steve, when did you, um, had you been a fan of Fastball? Had you ever seen them perform live before? Um, I, I was, I was a fan, but I, you know, I wasn't, you know, I hadn't, uh, to be perfectly honest, paid a lot of attention in the years. There's the studio that uh, we ended up cutting in. I had done a lot of work in, and there was pictures of the guys on the wall. So I had been staring at them for years. <laughs> what studio? The drawings of us. <laughs> what studio? Jack, Jack Rock's place. Oh. <laughs> I, I mean, it, it, for some reason, Jack just puts these pictures on the walls, and they stay there for like decades. So they're yeah. right if you walk out of the studio, out of the control room into the studio, the guy's pictures were there. It's like, you know, there's a basketball from, from God knows how long ago. So He's I referring to a drawing that was sort of pinned up below uh, an eight by 10 promo solo photo of me that uh, Conrad from Trail of Dead had drawn. Very good artist, by the way. He's fantastic drawing artist and it's below the actual photograph and it's really funny it's been there for I've been sitting there forever hanging forever. The wall. easily <laughs> 10 if not more 15 years and i've been working <laughs> at that studio for at least that long so i look very different so they're always in my mind <laughs> uh -huh. um that, that helped us cement our you know our opportunity yeah to, to work well, also it was very serendipitous um, to go back because that's one of my favorite studios in town is is Jack Rock's place and we did um, keep your wig on out there yeah with Jim Valentine is that how you say his name yeah yeah I always want to say Valentine but it's anyways he's the engineer he was the engineer on keep your wig on as well so that was very for me very serendipitous because I always loved the record that other record um, keep your wig on I love going out to Jackson recording it. So Steve's like, I know the studio called, called this. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Tree that's, that's the tree, yeah, tree, tree fort. Yeah. I was like, I, I can't believe it. 
that's amazing. You like working there. That's my favorite place. It actually is my favorite studio in the yeah, world. Yeah. Much. Really wow. in the world. Any opportunity I get to work there, I'll, I'll go. It's got a really good feel. I don't know what it is. I always imagined in my mind that it was so much bigger. Like after recording, we did Keep Your Wig On in like 2003 or something, 2004. So I'm going, we're going back out to that mansion. You know, like to me, in my mind, it was this opulent, huge place. And then you get there and you're like, it's not as big as I remember. That, yeah, it's not that massive or, <laughs> or deluxe, but it's nice. It's a nice homey vibe. And the story of that place is that Jack Rock, the owner, it's his house, but it's on the sort of the north side of his house. And uh, Jim Valentine built this rig out of like, you know, a lot of old vintage stuff that Jack uh, acquired. And so you got stuff there from the 40s and 50s and it just got this, and you know, it's just such a great vibe too. But there's there's a sound thing, if I'm not wrong, Steve, that, that that it contains that no other place has. I'd agree. Yeah, it's, well, you know, he collects, he had been collecting audio for decades, like before anybody was really collecting audio, Jack was, mm -hmm. was doing it um, in Germany, like he was uh, in East Germany for, for a while. So he was able to collect stuff that probably doesn't exist anywhere else in the world, certainly not these days. So it, it does have a lot of special stuff and he's kind of a special guy. And, yeah, it's a it's a it's a pretty cool spot. And now that you know, I, I used to have a problem because I'm really allergic to cats, and used to have like four, like 17 or 18 year old cats wandering around. Uh, yeah. So I used to have to like, you know, these days it would look normal, but back in the old days I would look like a, you know, like I was going into a CV ward. I'd have a mask and goggles, and <laughs> I had to work under these ridiculous, you know, just trying to keep myself healthy. But uh, the cats all passed, so now it's uh, safe to walk in there without a mask. Right. Um, so the band walk into the studio, you're there, it's day one. Let me ask you this, Joey, what, what was the difference of making a record in, well, I guess you would have made it in, no, you made it in 2019, correct? In April, May, and then we put it out in October, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, that can't be right. No, it's not. <laughs> oh, no, was it a year before? No, no we had a long wait for this one. Yeah, actually. it was 2018. Yeah. Okay, so and we it, made it, it in 2018. It was in April. It was. It started in April, and then I think April 20th or something like that. And, yeah, uh, that's right. We recorded in about a week, and then we went to another place to do overdubs. And, and yeah, so right. it was done pretty quick. And week. I was asking this to Joey, but anyone can answer, I guess. But. <laughs> Let Joey answer, otherwise he's not going to get a word in edgewise. Well, he probably has the most accurate re recollection. What's it like making a fastball record in, in 2018 versus uh, 1998 or 1997? Or you guys all drive drive your cars to the studio. What time did you start at? Do you have lunch breaks? Do you have dinner breaks? Do you just, I've, I've heard from, from the little promo vid that we did that Steve Berlin, uh, has problems stopping working. He likes to go long and hard. So, well, yeah, Steve's Steve's a hard worker, that's for sure. But I, the thing that impressed me most about Steve was in pre-production, <clears throat> he uh, he really uh, understood the way the band communicates, and and because of that, he he communicated with us in a way that that resonated with all of us, and it made the pre-production process very fruitful. I think we got through the stuff, you know, pretty quickly. Uh, whatever ideas he had, we tried. If they didn't work, you know, if we didn't like him as a band, we'd say so, and he was fine with that. So there's a real the fact that he's been doing this for so long and worked with the people he's worked with really played to, you know, played to the strengths of the record. And um, thank you. One the difference between working in '98 and, and here, we're a much better band. You know, we we're far better at what we do. Playing wise, songwriting wise, communication wise, relationally, everything's so much better. Um, we're far more mature. We, I think, we're making the best music we've ever made. Uh, and <clears throat> Steve, you know, he's he's really good at getting you outside of your comfort zone. Like for me, 
I cut just a couple of examples on a girl you pretended to be, the, the part that I play. I never would have even thought of that. And he said, try this. And I tried it and something I would never have done and, and wasn't really, had never really performed, but it came off great. Same thing for Redeemed. I basically surrounded myself with a junkyard and just hit all kinds of crap as we played the song and it came out great. And those are two of my favorite songs on the record. Mm, very cool. Um, I'm going to ask a couple questions that fans are asking here. I'm not going to, I'm not going to buzz them in, but, um, this is kind of a tech question. So this is from, um, this is, this is from John Ebersberger. I hope I'm saying that right, John, but band and Steve, what's your favorite vocal mic for recording? <laughs> I don't know shit about that stuff. I, I just like, <laughs> stick, fucking put something in front of me and turn it on. That's, That's how we get producers and go to studios. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, whichever one works. I, I don't have one. I mean, uh, there's, if I had to pick one, it'd be a Tell fucking 251, but they're very rare. Uh, I don't even think Jack had one of those. Um, but, you know, it's I, I've, I've been in situations where um, I could have literally picked any mic in the world, not not exaggerating, like people with big budgets said, you know, let's, let's have a mic shoot out of them and let's just get all of them. And I, I did one with this uh, artist that I worked with and um, it was crazy. We had probably 20 mics in the room and we went through every single one of them. And we ended up with uh, a $400 uh, Coles mic, which is a ribbon mic. And we actually, uh, not only did we end up with a, with, actually it's more than, it's like $1,200 mic, uh, but we actually oh, sang into the geez. back side of it. So with all these wonderful condensers and everything, we ended up with a you know like a weirdly, a weirdly positioned, uh, relatively easily found ribbon mic. But I don't you know to be honest with you, um, I've done some of my favorite songs. One of my favorite things I've ever done was recorded on a on a computer, the same mic that you're listening to me on. It was a woman singing in into her computer, and it doesn't matter. I mean, if if it's sung with passion and and commitment, the the tools don't matter. Right. Um, same gentleman, different question. Do you ever use a click track or record live? Yes, we do both sometimes. Yeah, it, just, yeah. it just depends on the situation. Um, sometimes you really do need a click because otherwise it's going to take forever to get what you're trying to get. Um, because some songs... Um, you might need to do a lot of, you know, if, you, if you're going to really try to do something elaborate, you don't want to have to try and get it um it's impossible to do live and then and then if you're you're going to try and edit it it's a nightmare if you don't have a click so in those cases you use a click but other times a uh, click ruins it if it's too it's too strict if the time keeping's too strict some songs want to float around and and um and then as far as live if it sounds good if the band playing it live sounds good you should do it that that's I the idea I, way can, I can point out something that would interest this this uh asker um we tend to record when we do our basics with joey and try to get the drums down mainly that's what we start with we um joey has the click we don't have the click we just let joey have the click and he counts it off we play without a click but joey's like he yeah. does the job of getting that grid, staying on the grid, but also letting it breathe a little bit. And I think over the years, Joey's gotten really good at that. Right. So I don't think we vary from good, that. that Other than a good an odd time when we might not use a click, but I don't recall. A lot of times we don't use a click. Yeah. Uh, step in, the song Step in the Light doesn't have a click. Also, uh, Tanzania doesn't have a click. That was just me and Joey in the room. I was just staring at him. We were looking at each other and we would just go. Like all those, all those little things uh, are, were just us looking at each other. I mean, obviously there's a time signature. And you're roughly following the beat, right. but it's pretty arbitrary. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, I've got a good, this is a good question from uh, Julia and Nathan watching from the UK. <clears throat> Hi guys, The Help Machine is a beautifully produced album with brilliantly crafted songs. In terms of production and or songwriting, is there anything that you have learned from this album that you will carry forward when making future recordings? 
Good question. Good question. I well, I mean, if we're talking about this particular album, then I think it's great to to bring up why Steve was so beneficial, at least the way I look at it. it and Joey touched on this too. It's just that he came up with ideas that we would not have come up with. And if I can take away personally stuff uh, um, about that would be uh, that, um, you know, I'm not always right, really, when it comes to the big picture of how things, you know, might be better. You know, I, I get locked on to what I think is the way this song goes and it's how it should go. And, um, you know, it takes somebody to sort of, you know, turn me to look at this, <laughs> you know, and uh, Steve was really good for that. And I don't know if I've been as receptive, it might be me too, you know, just being more receptive to the producer's opinions and ideas. But, you know, if, if you're talking about learning, I would say, yeah, I listened to the guy you hired to, you know, enhance your record. Yeah. Um, was there anything left on the, uh, What's the expression? Anything left on the killing floor? Was there anything that you, yeah. either of yeah. you, uh, uh, either three of you, that you went into it thinking this song's got to be on the record and Steve thought otherwise, or one of you thought otherwise as you got going? And, um, and part two to this question is, what, are there songs that um, kind of goes hand in hand with question one, but that might end up on a future fastball record that you thought would be on the help machine and didn't end up? Well, we had co-writes that didn't really. Oh, right. They didn't really get off the ground. And Tony we had, had songs to do anyway. Tony had other songs too. Then I had a few songs. You know, Steve just made a list of what he liked, and yeah. Did those. So there were leftover songs that never even entered. Yeah, that the, that's the an interesting. That's an interesting thing. I'm sorry to cut you off, Miles. I just want to jump in real quick. One thing I want to point out, which, which it'll be good to kind of reveal how this happened was, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe, so there's 11 songs on the help machine. Seven were written by Miles, four were written by Tony, but there was co-writes that didn't make the record, which is what you just alluded to. And that wasn't a Tony Miles Joey call, from what I understand, right? That was you, Steve, that got this collection of songs and and cherry yeah. picked the top eleven, I guess. Yeah, I was kind of um, agnostic about it. You know, I, I just, I mean, I, I just kind of let them. Uh, I mean, I, I like, you know, normally when I, <laughs> I tell them, just send me everything, like every little scrap. And I don't, you know, doesn't, even if it's not really a song, send it because I, you know, it's not unusual that I'll, I can Frankenstein you know, an idea here and an idea there. So I don't, I think, uh, how many did we have all together from the pile? Like 20 something, right? Wow. Yeah. Uh, a few. Yeah. Uh, and then I just kind of like mess around with it, you know, like kind of, I, I have this spreadsheet that I keep and I, I have this kind of weird rating system where every time I listen to it, I kind of re-rate it because sometimes things either start high and end up low or vice versa. That it's not unusual that something that doesn't, hit me the first time kind of gets to me by the second or third listen and then the it all kind of I don't know it's the sort of dynamic scoring system I guess right and then uh, we kind of just whittled it down I think to I want to say like 13 or so and then just there were out two that we recorded that didn't make it that we did some work on we had right. that song Sadie that didn't quite right. remember that yeah, Sadie. And really then know. we had that song, uh, Traveling Blind, as well. Right. That we yeah. spent some time on. Right. But I'm always in favor of ditching stuff that isn't... If if you record a song and it comes out and it's easy and it sounds great, and then you get another one, and one of them's giving you a lot of trouble, if, it's, if it doesn't look like it's going to bear fruit, I can kick that thing overboard. You can always get to it later ideally and and it's just chewing up a bunch of time and it's not rewarding you the song's trying to tell you something like it's not ready yet it's not ready to be recorded you know uh, that's right. been my experience over my entire recording with this band and anything else i've ever done it's like it don't try to force it uh because recording should be to me is like you're documenting what's there 
if you're documenting and it doesn't look good, that means it's it's just not good. Right now, it's just not good. You know, right. Sometimes the, the, there's songs like that that just soak up so much time, and you realize that you know you're gonna you're you're soaking up all this time that you're, you're gonna make a, a good song okay, not yeah, a good song great. You know, you're just trying to raise it to the level of everything else, and that's kind of the that's one thing that I learned is you know you sort you sort of get a sense as you go into it that well this one could be great but it's going to take 40 percent of our time to get it to that level is it is it really worth it you know right yeah you know, none of us have that much time anymore like once no. upon a time you know record budgets were such that you could actually kind of reflect and yeah. stop and start yeah. and do stuff and move into the studio now you just can't you got to just go just get it done yeah um Kind of in the same vein here, but I guess going back a step, there's a question here from Ryan Kemp to the band. What's your approach to writing songs, starting with lyrics, starting with chords, etc.? However, for me, it's however it gets done. Uh, I just trying to get it. And the, the longer I do this, the more I realize that, you know, where do ideas come from? You know, no one knows. But I do know this, when they're coming, Usually the best songs, they just, they just come on in and you, you want to try to get that as quick as you can. And um, if you can't get it all at the time, you, I've also learned again, not to force it. If you, if you really just, I got to finish this fucking song and you, you sit there and you work and you try and pound it, you usually kill it. It's, you get to where, at least for me, where you're like, I never want to hear that again. It's just terrible. It's like a, it's like a maimed bird, you know, it's the worst. So I, I prefer to stay out of my own way, which is just work on the song, but remain open-minded, I guess is what I would say. I don't know how Tony does it. Well, I, I do it just like you, any number of ways and any way that, you know, gets it going and gets it across. While I agree, uh, you know, I definitely agree with the, if, it, if it's really good, it usually comes really, uh, quickly and you sort of let it in. Uh, I like that explanation. However, I've never spent so much time working <laughs> on particular songs as I have in the last six months. Mm. Um, where I don't know what's going to happen to this song and the song keeps going and going for months and working on these songs. And I've never done this before. And sometimes you ruin a song, but that's rare. I think that if you sit and spend a lot of time with this thing, wake up in the middle of the night with it driving you crazy, you know, and then it's worth working on. And God, if you have the time and the lack of distraction, uh, I think it's a cool new method for me. I'm like mm -hmm. really getting into it. I've spent months on about six songs and loving it. That's great. I, I, I agree that like you can work on a song a long time. That for me, the point, I guess, is that I've got to keep myself open minded as I'm working on it. So I can work as hard as I want on it. But I but then I got to step back and then give it a few days and look at it. And I agree with you when I have an idea that I think is really good. It drives me insane. It just won't stop. <laughs> it's like the song is playing nonstop in my head. Yeah. And it's yeah. almost like a lot more lately, too. Could we just finish this song so I don't have to hear it anymore? Like, can it just off yeah. it from? You know, once I get the 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 vocal down on a demo, yeah, it stops. I get the relief. <laughs> but uh, I, I want to say, uh, what was I going to say? Oh man. Oh, uh, I just recently joined another songwriting game, which I had taken a break from uh, for about a year and a half. An another songwriting and what? Sorry, Tony. Game. Song, songwriting game group. Okay. Okay. So, you know, some of y'all might be familiar with this where you like get in a group of people and every week somebody comes up with a topic or a line or uh, a, a rule, you know. Uh, and like one time I got this for a rule was like no rhyming. None of the lines can rhyme. Uh -huh. And I'm like, what? You know, and I immediately react. My immediate reaction was like, this can't, you can't, can't be Well, it actually turned out to be a really liberating uh, experience when you like, don't have to run. You just get 
a cadence down and you start going with it. And that's how um, a song from Step in the Light um, that we, we did was, uh, was uh, just another dream. And that has no rhymes. And then I realized the song by Tracy Chapman, Fast Car, No Lines Rhyme in that song. Huh. Wow. Oh, that's interesting. I never thought about that. Yeah, it took me, me a while to like, wait a second. You know, because you're never looking for that kind of thing, really. Oh. In a song you're listening to. Wow. Right. Have you um, heard the, uh, the Black Pumas one? The Black Pumas version of that song? Oh, Fast Car? Yeah. Oh, it's, no, I haven't heard it. It's, just, it's recent. They just, I think they just put it out, just kind of put it out. It's amazing. Actually, right. I, I never really cared for the song until I heard their version. Now, right. I love it. Oh, well, that's always the best. Yeah. Um, there's a question in, uh, from a fan here, and it's also something that I was going to bring up, just going back to kind of the overall vibe of the Help Machine. It's if you compare it to your previous, um, I think Help Machine was record number seven, to your previous six records, you know, it's a much darker um, left of center, and it often seems like, it's commentary of the world today. Keep in mind, this was made and as we've now uh, determined in 2018. So a couple of years before the absolute fucking chaos that the world has now gone into over the last two years. But was that something that you guys went into before any songs were selected? Is that something that as Steve Berlin chose these 11 songs from your bag of songs that it started to say, okay, here's this, darker i mean god damn just the title of the record it's almost like you knew the world was going to go uh um you know upside the interesting down thing about that is that those songs like the help machine were written in that was written in 2013 crazy i i would i had no idea what the world would look like i was just, you know that's just the, what was coming through and whatever i recorded and and um a song like Surprise Surprise was was I wrote before 2016. So a lot of those songs are just for me anyways, were older and I wasn't uh, maybe it's just a subconscious thing. Well I think it's what all the percent of the material on this record that I wrote <laughs> was was fairly recent. And you get this one all gone fuzzy and it's it's a story of isolation and uh. holding up and, you know, peeping out my window, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and I had obviously, you know, I had no concept of really doing that other than it's a sort of, uh, you know, it's the sort of thing that I think when you get creative and you isolate a little bit and you don't really want to leave the house, and you know you don't really want to deal with society and blows your focus or whatever um that's where i was coming from at the time and then wow you know like singing it in quarantine or in lockdown it gives itself a whole you know a whole new relevance and then there's the song uh white collar and i mean when we started you know, recording it or whatever, I wasn't really getting all this. I wrote it with the idea of like, oh, you know, maybe a corrupt clergyman or an embezzling, you know, businessman or some guy who, you know, basically sucks and gets all gets over all the time and doesn't really have to, you know, uh, you know, suffer any consequences from his actions. You know, and even when he gets popped and he's in jail, it's like the worst thing he has to do is contemplate his lack of freedom or whatever, having to wear an orange jumpsuit. You know, it's really kind of like an unsatisfying ending. But look, when we started doing the video, though, we found this doll that looked just like Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> and that's why, you know, new things sort of popped in my head and more current ideas and, you know, relevance to, and I just believe, you know, whether, you know, you know, some of the songs that you wrote, Miles, were, were much older, but we still came together and we put them together at the time that we did as a group. And we're all, you know, you and I have been 
talking for months and months before we even got into lockdown about, you know, what's on our mind, what's society doing, yeah. what's going on with the, you know, this new century. And, you know, um, I think that when you do anything creative, artistically, poetically, musically, you're, you're um, a product, your output is a product of your environment. And, you know, it can't help but, especially if you do it, you know, in one go, you can't help but it be relevant and be uh, right. You know, um, tangible. Who put the track order together, the 11 songs? Was that more a Steve thing or was that the band? And then my part two is, how did the record get its title? Why the Help Machine? Why did that track pop out as being the title? I don't know. I think, you know, we've... <laughs> I, th I thought it was a good title because of, of the way the world was, the way the world is. You know, the world's gotten really, if you compare the world to the way it was 10, 15 years ago, it's, it just seems like a, a shit show now. So I thought that was a good title. But uh, I don't know, it seems like what, the last record was called Step Into Light After a Song. So I don't know, maybe we've gotten lazy about... <laughs> just name it after a song. Just pick a song and, and name it after that. You know, I don't know. <coughs> Step into light at the time also seemed like a good title. We were getting the band really going again, and so I don't know. I, I as far we didn't think. Well, it's sequence though. I mean, I think we had to intersperse the songs evenly. Number one, and and not be like, okay, right. Side one is going to be Tony songs one after the other, and then it's Miles or whatever, or then stuff my stuff on the back. I mean, I think there was a sort of, you know that need was there. And then, you know, what order? Peter, did you not have any input in that? Did, I, I seem to recall you. No, I, I don't think, I don't I, think I did. I, think I, think I, I know did. that we've had, we've had, you know, input from other people outside the band that have. Did you yeah. do the order, Steve? I, I remember, I, I mean, I usually do. I mean, I, I, I don't, my vague memory is, yeah, I, I put it together. But it's always a, you know, it's a juggling act. I mean, you know, it's never done until it's done. But I, I just kind of wanted it to be, uh, yeah, I, I wanted some balance. You know, I, I didn't want it to be more than, you know, two, you know, I mean, it, it wasn't necessarily like ping pong, but I, I kind of tried to get it, you know, light, dark, fast, slow, minor, major, you know, Tony Miles. So, you know, it's, it's definitely a balancing act, but I think it flows well. I mean, I'm, I'm happy. I listened to it this morning. I think it flows very well. It flows great. Yeah, okay. And I'm like really excited when the next song comes on. It's it's always a little bit surprising, you know, because I still haven't. I, it's not like I've got it. That's the idea that you brain in my brain. You, be, you don't want it to feel like you know, like a Coldplay record where it's like eleven versions of the same song. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard of them. Uh, <laughs> Sorry um, for fans out there. <laughs> Other than the band, there were some guests on this record. Was that a, a, and I know I know some of the answers to these questions. I'm just trying to ask things that I think people are going to be interested in. But we have, um, we have Andy well, Stack. Bruce, I think you got to bring up Bruce. Well, yeah. right. We got, so first and foremost, Bruce Hughes, who is, um, you know, almost like a, a, a fourth member of the band to some degree i mean he's toured a lot with the band and well, i wouldn't go that far but he's yeah. a he's he's been a collaborator on two albums okay he played with us live briefly it wasn't that long but he did he was uh he was he was the bass player on little white lies pretty much yeah i think all yep. the songs yeah so we love the way he plays you know, Tony plays really great bass too, but it's a different kind of, it's a more aggressive, it's a different style. And Bruce, you know, Bruce plays bass for a living. Bruce is way more versatile. Yeah. Than, uh, musically. And he's got a quick sense and a quick ear and he can, I, I've also, I've done a couple of things with him since then, you know, on solo mm -hmm. stuff in the studio. And he's just so fast. He's just unbelievable. And then, you know, if you hear something, you, you'll listen to this first or second take and you'll hear a couple things and you'll just go fix it, and boom, you're done. And then the vocals, I think that he really contributed with, you yeah. know, another dimension vocally for us. And 
he's a really good back background singer. He knows he's got a really good ear. And uh, there's two things. Serendipity wise, uh, I talked to Steve about getting someone to play bass on the record. And he goes, I know this guy named Bruce Hughes. <laughs> Is that real? <laughs> really? That's, that's yeah. absolute fact. So yeah. I had just worked with him on um, on uh, Marsha Ball's record just prior to your you guys' record. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, I didn't so, know. So it was a no-brainer, you know. It was like it's Steve, Steve suggested it, but we'd already, you know. And I play with him every Sunday in the Resentment. So, and then right. the other thing is I love about Bruce is, uh, you know, Bruce is very opinionated, and he was listening to the tracks, and he was, you know, I had to the help machine, or maybe it was a uh, friend or foe, and he's listening to the track, and he goes. You should let me. You should let me. You should let me record that. I, I can do it better than that guy. And I go, "That's you." And he goes, "Oh, <laughs> damn it!" <laughs> As it turns out, he was in Marfa, you know, six years before, and played the bass on it. And it was hilarious. It was so hilarious. He's like, "I could do better than that guy." <laughs> I was like, "I'm like, it's you playing." <laughs> and he goes, "Oh, okay." Then all of a sudden, the bass part's fine. <laughs> yeah, <right>. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> um, how did Andy Stack from Y Oak and how did Gordy Quist and John Chipman from Band of Heathens get involved with the record and how are they on it? It's John Chipman. Oh, John Chipman, right. Well, okay, so uh I uh that was just you know, Andy Steck literally I was in Marfa recording those two songs, Friend or Foe and uh, Help Machine thinking I was going to put out a solo or whatever for a solo record, or maybe I was just demoing them. I don't know what I was thinking at the time. I was just in the studio doing the work. And the very first night, uh, the guy, Gory Smelly, his real name, uh, whose studio, and he was the engineer out in Marfa, he goes, this guy, Andy Steck, wants to come by and check out the gear and check out the studio. He plays in that band, Y Oak. Do you mind if he comes by? And I said, no, I don't. Now, I'm by myself making this record. Like, I'm going to, I don't even, haven't even thought about how I'm going to do drum tracks or whatever. I was like, I'll put a clip down. And I, so this guy comes in and I'm like, do you, uh, you play, you play, what instruments do you play? He plays, I, I play drums and keyboard. And I go, you want to play on my recording? And he goes, when? Sure, when? And I go, now. So basically that's how I got him on the record is uh, what became the record is he, we, we tracked, uh, yeah, we tracked the help machine with him on the drums and then he added a bunch of stuff. The guy's really amazing. And then mm -hmm. friend or foe, he added the keyboard parts and the Evo parts. So he did a lot, but it wasn't thinking like, this is going to be the final, you know, this is going to be the recording of these songs. It was just, it was just demoing the songs. So that's how he ended up on it. But that's literally like six years before. Yeah, crazy. I know. Well, you can do anything with computers. Yeah. I mean, uh, and so then, and then the other guys were. The Gordy were, and. Uh, they yeah. were, well, Chipman also played on the demo. That's how he ended up on the, he okay. played drums on Friend or Foe. And then Gordy was there. It was his studio that we decamped to after, um, after Jack Rock's place, we went over to Gordy. What's the name of that studio? Uh, the Finishing School. The Finishing School. So he has taken over that studio from our dear departed friend, George Reef, who also played in this band. So we, we were recording at George's old house, which was really a trip. Um, and George died a, a few years ago, it was really sad. So that was, that was kind of heavy, but Gordy was hanging around just making sure stuff stuff worked and if you're in the room and you can you can sing and play and i'm there i'm probably gonna ask you to do something, something I, mean, yeah. I was like wow we got gordy we got bruce and we got tony and me i mean we could really do some harmonies on this and that's what happened right um charlie sexton how did he end up and and i don't know if if people know what he does on the record actually i don't know if we put that in the notes i guess i can charlie, charlie is an amazing guitar player and he's like the epitome of a texas guitar player to me and he plays the solo in, in well the lead guitar 
running through the whole song of girl you pretended to be. And that's where he comes in. Right. And he just showed up one day at the studio, correct? Well, we asked him to do it and and he came in one evening and yeah, laid it down in the evening and we got to hang out and you know, everything he did was astounding. Yeah. It was like four four, four takes they were all on yeah. And just yeah, we picked the best or our favorite things out of it. Hey, boys and girls, I'm going to have to go. I'm afraid that I'm getting the evil eye here. So okay, okay. part of it. Um, Make good music. Yeah, I'm going to do my best. Thanks for all the nice words. Take care, everybody. Thanks for doing this. Bye, Thanks, buddy. Steve. Yeah. And on that note, I guess we can kind of wrap this up anyway. Um, I've been kind of rifling through the questions and uh, answering things we go. I'm, I'm trying to just keep everything help machine related. There's some... Uh, there's some uh, comments on Adam Schlesinger. There's some comments on Pledge questions, but quite frankly, I don't think we need to really go down those routes. Um, I think we can wrap this up. If you guys haven't heard the record, this is the vinyl. It's a beautiful blue vinyl or there's black vinyl. I'll send a link. Um, I'll send a link so that everyone knows where to get it. Uh, I guess one thing we can kind of conclude it with, and Tony, you touched on this when we were talking about um, how the question about how, so, you know, if words come before chords, et cetera, but have you guys been writing music over these past six or whatever, however many number of months this craziness has been now? And um, what's the next step for fastball as of today that you guys think? I'll, I'll start. I've been writing. I know Miles has begun writing again. He was out, out of town for a while, but we haven't been able to write together or really work together. Um, so I think we're just gonna be compiling material and you know try to get together and do some more recording in the near future. Uh, I think our focus right now is trying to get back to work or whatever that means as a band um, performing together right it's you know it's still you know it's still a pandemic last time i looked which was a few minutes ago and um you know we have some things in the works for 2021 which we'd love to be able to do hopefully when we get to those dates which uh we're starting to get some stuff together for late january early february and if we get to that time and it's you know a cool thing to do and not an idiotic thing to do, then we're going to try and get back to work as best we can. Um, we've talked about doing some virtual, um, you know, or, you know, internet stuff, you know, some streaming stuff. Um, the main, the main concern for me at least would be for us to be able to get together in one room or on one stage. And I'm doing a lot of research on that right now. I'm actually getting together with some friends in, Renfro and we're going to do a thing on October 18th, which is a live show on a stage with no crowd streaming. And hopefully we'll be able to do, you know, the same thing with fastball uh, as we, you know, we're not going to be able to jump out there and, you know, get on the road. Well, nobody's ready for that. Um, on the 23rd, fastball is playing in Austin, a live show. Um, at basically in the parking lot of a big arena called HEB Center. And it's in basically North Austin in Cedar Park. So we're doing that and it's a big stage and it's basically the parking lot and they line it up so cars can come in in the drive-in format and pay for car loads. And, you know, you get to see a show, you get out, sit on your hood or whatever, get some chairs in your little space and experience a live concert and it'll be just as uh, novel for, and I don't know if I intended uh, as for us as it would be for the people in their car loads watching it. Right. Yeah. yeah I'm glad you brought that show up and I hope uh, people come out and we're uh, trying to do the best with uh, the world we live in and play a live show. So yeah, this is step one on October 23rd somewhat of a hometown show as tony said just a bit north of the city and um and uh and i think that kind of wraps things up any last words any last 
questions? Any, um, Joey, are we are still there with us? I'm here. <laughs> Just, thank, thanks to everybody who, who uh, logged on to this thing. Really appreciate all the support and can't wait to see you out there playing live. Whenever that, whenever that turns out to be. Yeah. And uh, no, the show that there are a couple people have been asking here since Tony just talked about that show. No, it's not going to be live streamed. Um, as far as we know, anyway, there's no plans on it being live streamed. Maybe we'll do a, a show um, and stream it. Maybe we'll do a show expressly just for the internet. And, yeah. You know, yeah. we haven't, I haven't even seen these guys since uh, March. March 11th. I haven't seen their faces in person. I haven't, you know, so uh, we, the first step is to actually convene and start playing music again, and then we'll figure the rest of this stuff out, you know? Yeah. Right. Right. Cool. Well, listen, thank you everyone for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, whether it's in Sunday morning, afternoon, or evening, I don't know where you're all tuning in from, but thanks for taking the time. And, uh, and, uh, just stay tuned to the website, stay tuned to their socials. We're not sure what we're doing with this footage right here, but this is a kind of one time only thing right now. So, and if you guys don't know, we haven't a shameless plug for miles as he's been doing these Tuesdays at 7 PM central. Um, yeah. On yeah. Facebook, on YouTube. If you go to the fastballs, YouTube channel, it's there. And, uh, also on our Twitter and I do it on my Facebook channel. So, Facebook.com slash Miles Zuniga loves you. I did it Tuesday at seven. And you know, we'll probably we'll probably do a fastball show, I sure hope, online as well. So yeah. Stay tuned. Yeah. Okay, everyone. Thanks Thank for you. tuning in. Thanks, you guys. Thank you.